Thank you. And I think I'm very fortunate to come after Dr. Mohap and Professor O'Connell because they've set a wonderful context. Um, I don't need to go into definitions of what unity, nation building, social cohesion, and also just in terms of the background to the role of museums and the conservative nature of museums and that link with memory as well. So I will start from the premise that we all believe in the constitution. Yes. From the premise that the Bill of Rights is an important document and an important framework for us. And that's our kickoff point. And I think also very importantly, I think we've generally um, all agree that none of those, the unity, the social economic renewal, the social cohesion and nation building, none of those can be achieved by museum professionals sitting in their buildings. There's a very, very deep engagement with people that's needed in all of those. So I'd like to start off, I'll make some general comments and then I'll refer to the District 6 Museum, um, the, which is the museum of my heart. And I will refer very briefly to some of the practices of that museum um, in, in, in closing. Yes. So museums, I believe, were in need of change bef long before the COVID pandemic hit. Obviously, this has brought a new dimension to thinking about change. But um, as um, Dr. Matoma has reminded us, museums across the world and museums in our country have been thinking about change, which is very necessary. I think COVID has just added an additional set of circumstances that should not change that intention of what it is that we want our museums to be. Some of my comments are based on an assumption that we will navigate the pandemic well enough so that we can attain a level of normality. And I won't go into a definition of what that means because partially I have an idea and partially it's also a little bit of an unknown of what that new um, situation is going to be after we've navigated or come out on the other side. How do museums ensure that they are always relevant in people's lives? So that's very important, that they mean something, that they continue to be spaces of learning, but it is not in the construction of the colonial mode, both of being a museum or of a particularly conservative pedagogy based on an assumption that people are empty vessels and museums need to fill them with knowledge. The knowledge that comes from, from experts. I also believe that we shouldn't just include people in a kind of deficit model because they were excluded from the past. We have to include people in our processes because we believe that they bring value to what we do. And if we don't listen to both what people can contribute from their own knowledge, their own knowledge of the world, the knowledge of life around them, um, formal knowledge as well. If we don't include or, or, or make a space for people to contribute that, then we run a, a risk of having a very kind of thin but knowledge base as well that excludes a level that can really strengthen um, the knowledge base of the museum. You need to think about what, you know, the museums, the, the concept of museum comes out of a colonial concept, construct. Um, it comes from a construct of where people come to view things, to look at things, to learn things. And we need to think about, it's not only the content that needs to change. Um, if we want to be a decolonized museum sector, what rules of the colonial museum mode are we prepared to break? Or how much are we prepared to think outside of the box while still maintaining the identity as a museum? I know that strategies are context specific and they need to be customized according to what works based on a close reading of local circumstances. And so what I will share maybe about the location of the District 6 Museum is very context specific to what that museum has been able to achieve and, and, and its location. But there are some principles that I think that can be generally applied. So District 6 Museum is a very different kind of museum in that it wasn't formed by the Cultural Institutions Act. It was built out of a movement of people who wanted to ensure that they could return to the land from which they'd been forcibly removed under apartheid. And also they wanted to ensure that the memory 
both of the land and of their struggle would be an important part um, <clears throat> of the city and the country's history as well. And in that also connecting to <clears throat> forced removals. It, it started as a place with a very strong restitution and human rights focus. And this movement started in the kind of dying days of apartheid in 1988. People got together and a, there was a call for a place of memory, but it formally launched as a museum on International Human Rights Day, 10th of December, 1994. So both the day and the year are very significant in the museum's life. So in terms of the whole approach to learning, I believe that the Stick Six Museum has got a very dynamic approach to learning and thinks of itself also as a learning organization. It embarks on several learning journeys with its community that's not only based on objects. And maybe I should just pause there and say that it is also a museum that really started without any objects. It started with people, it started with people coming together, people telling their stories, then people bringing their photographs along with their stories, bringing their documents, bringing artifacts. And, and that is also how now it's got quite a large collection but it is possible also to um, think of museums working in very different ways. For example, one of the ways that the District 6 Museum engages both with the site of displacement and with its community is through site walks, site engagements, and site-specific site art interventions. And in those, the museum sets up the platform that the people who participate are former residents of the area and they participate as knowledge makers and they populate the site with the, with the knowledge that they bring both about the past and also about the geography of the landscape. That knowledge needs to find its way out of the localized platform and I think that's the role that the museum can also play in making sure that it's not just an ephemeral experience and that it doesn't just disappear, but that that knowledge is captured in some way as well. We also need to think about different ways, new ways of working with archives. Um, how, do, how do archives interact with living memory and different ways of knowing such as memory, such as cultural um, performances, such as art as well, and how do these come together to create something new in terms of learning. And both, again, the museum as a learning institution and for people as well. There should be several platforms that museums can create um, for people to think while still hanging on to its own identity as a museum and not also become quite an amorphous community project. I think museums should be also willing to give up um, its maybe its central role in wanting to be part of leading everything and think about, for example, when supporting local issues like gender-based violence, maybe economic development of the community, that not, might not be its immediate expertise, but and we shouldn't always um, assume that other people are not doing anything. And so it is about forming those partnerships to, to be led by others as well. I think that's very important. So in some ways it feels like we, we do need, I'm just mentioning a few things, but I, it feels like we need a museum revolution because it's about changing the different modes of thinking. Um, it's not just sufficient, as I said, to add on a few things, to make people feel included, to make them feel that they can see themselves um, and get stories in the museum. It's really about changing the whole kind of, the, the base, philosophical base of what museums think of themselves to be. How do people, how do museums also help people to think of their own heritage that is as much about themselves and their own realities as it is about the great icons of our country? How do we ensure that we treat these iconic memories and iconic people respectfully, but also that they don't drown out the stories of people on the ground as well? I, I nearly said, uh, use the term that I'm not really comfortable with, which is ordinary people, because it kind of assumes that they are extraordinary people as well. But people on the ground, how do we have those respectful conversations, um, not throwing out the contributions of the great icons of our country, but how do we make that more inclusive as well? Because how does national healing happen? There isn't a moment 
where the nation heals. How does na nation building happen as well? It's never a complete journey. There's not, it's a slow, patient work of it's individual by individual. It is community by community. And then we have to start the work all over again because it is work that is never, never complete. I think it's very important also that we, 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 we make people or, or make people comfortable, yes, with, with the whole notion of diversity and different points of view. And in thinking about unity, there's always an assumption that unity is that we all eventually work and believe in the one thing. So I think there's a broad concept of what it unity involves, but our unity must be built so strongly that it can cope with diversity, with different opinions, with conflicts, because that is a part of life. And so this whole notion of the single rainbow nation, the unified nation is in some ways a kind of false construct because it should be able to um, should be able to accommodate all these different points of views behind multiple perspectives, because it's not a bad thing to have disagreements. I think it's only a bad thing when it causes people to fall up, um, to, to kind of fall apart in terms of what the, the overall goal is. In all of this, I think it's also very important that in addition to the technical skills that museum professionals. Bonita, uh, if you can just, uh wrap up uh, you just one minute over so i'll give you another minute. Oh, okay one last sentence i'm just wanting to say that i think it's important that museum professionals also are equipped then with this with what is normally thought of as soft skills of interacting with people together with the technical skills that they um hold in their portfolios and so i will hold off i would I will end off there i had i will not advocate i had some details about how we propose the museum revolution to take place but maybe we'll hold that for the question and answer session thank you thank you very much uh, miss bennett I'm, I'm i'm really pleased about the the case study of the the district six uh, museum um i remember vividly we we visited we were doing the defense review um appointed by the Minister of Defense and military veterans. So we were at the fort. I'm sure you know the fort, it's not far from the museum. We decided to visit the museum as well. Um, working on defense, but we were saying to ourselves, how can defense, how can the museum also inform our work in, 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 in defense and, you know, um, and the military establishment of our country? So we learned a lot um, from, from that museum, the history that you sketched out, it's actually very important. But you also raise a very important issue about, you know, unity being broad enough to include diversity um, because uh, unity and diversity, that's the motto of our country, diverse people unite. Um, that's what we are proud of. So thank you very much about that. Um, and it added to the, to the also the case study of uh, Robben Island Museum that uh, Dr. Mohapi also spoke to. And um, now let me open it up for uh, five minutes for the next, for questions. So between now 11.23 and 11.28, let's open it up for um, questions and comments on your uh, discussion on your input. Is, is there anything, Terence? I see you there. Uh, is there anything from the chat? I don't see anything from the chat box. Is there anybody who wants to uh, kick off? At the moment, I don't see anything. Uh, uh, maybe Tebo or Yaku can tell us something also. Okay, Yaku, Tebo, anything that you've noticed? Uh, doctor, there's currently nothing. Nothing at the moment, no? Okay, now let me go to um, Nelson Zwane. Do you have anything to say up to so far? <clears throat> Zwane? Nothing. Okay, uh, Miriam, Dr. Miriam Tawane? Nothing from that side, okay. Um, mm, 
Ntsako, Twala, do you have anything to say? Uh, nothing for, for now. Nothing for now. Okay. Now let's let's use this time to go on to the next presentation. Um, Professor, Professor Musekha, I think uh, the three presentations have set the stage for you um, because you really have got a much more broader national and international perspective. Um, even though at Kara Heritage Institute, you also focus at uh, IKS, uh, Indigenous Knowledge Systems. So I think it really sets a, 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 the, the, the real um, spectrum, spectrum for you to, to give your input, uh, Prof. We, we would appreciate if you can then come in um, on this topic of uh, unity, socioeconomic renewal, social cohesion, and nation building. Thank you, Prof. Uh, thank you. I think uh, you summed it well, but uh, <clears throat> I decided to uh, uh, title my talk uh, Harnessing African Humanism and the Cultural Heritage for Social Cohesion and Nation Building. Okay. And, and uh, I liked your summary about uh, museums linking the past, the present, and the future. And uh, I think uh, in that light, museums uh, become the surest means for the realization of the African uh, cultural uh, heritage, which will deal with issues of decolonization and so on. But I start from the premise that uh, there are three streams of history and culture. Uh, they are the Asian, European, and the African. But the African is the oldest a stream of history and culture. And because uh, that has not been recovered and internalized, we continue to be sub subordinated to other streams, especially the European stream of history and culture. So I would want to address that area. But let me start by saying African leaders and President Cyril Ramaphosa in particular, urged Africans to seek African solutions to African problems. The problems facing us today include not only the COVID uh, pandemic, but uh, the, more, the deepening moral degeneration and related social ills, including racism, tribalism, xenophobia, femicide, gender-based violence, abuse of women and children, drug and alcohol abuse. These social ills, in my view, are the greatest obstacle to social cohesion and nation building. Uh, so far, our attempts to address them have not succeeded because uh, we used the Eurocentric human rights culture, which uh, is not able to deal with our contemporary uh, problems. So in this paper, I argue that uh, we need a paradigm shift from the Western philosophy of human origins and patriarchal culture to the African philosophy of human origins, matriarchal and humanist uh, uh, culture. Uh, we, <clears throat> for the past 2000 years, African people suffered from slavery, colonialism and racial oppression. These crimes against the African humanity were justified by the hermetic hypothesis, which said that African people were descendants of Ham, the cursed son of Noah, and were destined to be hewers of wood and drawers of water for Asians and Europeans. This, thus Africans were treated as subhuman beings and forcibly dispossessed of their land and natural resources. Their cultures, languages, and religions were defined as paganism, outlawed, and replaced with their colonial counterparts. These acts of dis disposition and dehumanization of African people reached their peak at the Berlin Conference, which legitimized the carving up of Africa and colonization of different parts of the continent. But uh, what uh, the museums uh, can do for us is to uh, agree 
that before colonization, Africa had bigger kingdoms and empires than most parts of Europe. For instance, in Southern Africa, which I call Sabia, uh, we had uh, an empire called uh, the Empire of the People of the Sun, Empire of Bukaranga, Bukalaga, or Bukalaga. The citizens of that empire define themselves as the children of the locust of the sun, Vanabaji Kalaga. Therefore, this uh, classification of people into Venda, Bedi, Zulu, Kosa, and Debele uh, did not exist. The people saw themselves as one and the same people who descended from the sun. And therefore, they called themselves the children of the sun. And that empire of Ukalaga stretched from the Zambezi into the Cape Colony. And the maps exist, but our institutions who are keeping these maps will never reveal those maps because they don't want us to know who we are. But who were the founders of this empire of Munomotapa, which had its uh, capital city at Mapunguri? Uh, today, we have the Mapunguri Museum at the University of, uh, of Pretoria. Some caricature museum was cre created at Mapunguria itself. But the real story that is told about the Mapunguria uh, civilization and these artifacts is not told by Africans themselves. And it is even said that uh, this is a lost uh, 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 civilization. Now, the truth of the matter is that the people who founded the Mapunguria civilization were came from the province of Napta in the Sudan. Napta is today called Godoba, Godofa. That was the heartland of ancient Ethiopia. And ancient Ethiopia uh, was the mother of ancient Egypt, Egypt. Who founded ancient Ethiopia in Egypt? It is uh, the uh, indigenous African people called Ethiopians or Nubians who originated at the source of the Nile. And this means therefore that the museums in the Sudan, in Ethiopia uh, and in Egypt are containing the history and memory of Africa. As Professor Diop correctly said, before we can link the history of other parts of Africa with the history of Ethiopia and Egypt, we will never know as Africans who we are. Now, the people that established uh, Mapungui, as I said, came from uh, Napta. These people did not believe in a God, the father and the son. They believed in God, the mother and the son. Therefore, these people did not have a, a patriarchal culture. They had a matriarchal culture. Now, if we, if we were to revive that matriarchal culture, it means that uh, we would not have the problem of femicide, gender-based violence, and all these uh, 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 problems. Now, uh, I, I want to say again that uh, there is a zodiac of Dendera, the zodiac of Merwe, zodiac of Mapunguwe, of Great Zimbabwe, which summarize the world view of these people of the sun. And these zodiacs are being hidden from um, our, our children. And it is in these zodiacs that you find uh, that uh, the supreme being is a woman, the uh, uh, the child of that woman is the son, and that son gave birth to four holy beasts before the throne of God, who are Mundu, Mutapa, Munomutapa, and uh, Amen. Which means that uh, the framework for the Western cultures and everything actually comes from Africa, and that is not recognized and uh, uh, proper, promulgated. But because time is limited, I just want to quickly say that uh, 
what we need to do, I suggest, is to use the year 2021, which is the year uh, of uh, Charlotte Matreke, to then uh, write, uh, maybe working together with the Dijon Museum and other participants here, uh, write a South African diary of women activists. Starting with the wars of uh, resistance, we have people like Mantatisi, uh, the Mujaji, uh, Rain Queens, uh, and Lubazeni of Swaziland, Nehanda of Zimbabwe, uh, and so on and so forth. There are so many women. So that uh, this year we produce that book about the contribution of women to the freedom that we enjoy today. But secondly, yes, uh, day before yesterday, I addressed uh, a meeting uh, of uh, social uh, sports, arts, and culture in Limpopo. I suggested that maybe because royal women and women in general are the ones who are speaking the indigenous languages, they have the stories about where we come from, where we're going, they have all the idioms, that maybe we should form a South African a royal women's forum uh, with nine chapters so that we can focus on collecting the stories from the so-called ordinary women and collecting artifacts and beads and all these things and document them and have uh, 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 th those museums. And I think in that way, we can really begin the real African cultural uh, renaissance that will take all our people on board because to a large extent, those of us who claim to be educated, we have read foreign books, we have internalized a foreign ideologies and ideas, and we are able to repeat them in good English, and we think that is what education is about. I think education is about self-knowledge, and indigenous African languages are the mainstay of the African cultural heritage and indigenous knowledge systems, and I think uh, our focus should go to go there, but for this year, we must do something radically different to say that uh, there's no God who is, who is a man, uh, who is a son that has no mother. The supreme being is a woman, and that woman is the virgin mother of a son, the son God, which manifested itself uh, as the son that we can see and without the sun that we can see, there's no life on earth. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mutsekha. Thank you so, so much for the wisdom, the wealth of knowledge that you have uh, shared with us. Um, the Mapungupe Museum, the rich history of uh, the new bands and particularly the um, the, the history of, of, of culture, whether it's the African approach, the European or the Asian, uh, they all form part of the knowledge base that we need to have in order to comprehend the impact of slavery, colonialism and oppression. And also how to respond to today's uh, issues of femicide and gender-based uh, violence. And of course, the issues of the, the Zodiac would be able to um, to, to lead us. I also like the recommendations that you, you have put in. Um, you have suggested, uh, for instance, the, the writing of a diary of South African women activists. And I think that would be the launch pad, then we can go to SADC and the whole of Africa. And, and, and the reason why, as you had expressed, um, the African um, area seems to be uh, sub, subjugated, or not subjugated, but um, uh, subordinated to the European one. It's because the Europeans have been able to record and write things. And in Africa, we have to begin to do a lot of writing ourselves so that we can reflect uh, our own history, just in the same way that uh, Ms. Bennett was indicating about uh, um, a District 6 Museum, that it came out of the activism of the people in 1988. 
And so the same activism needs to happen uh, if we have to get the diary off the ground. So thank you very much for the contribution. Colleagues, let me open it up uh, to, to questions and comments. Um, I, I, there's, a, there's a chat that came in. Maybe we should start with it. Um, one from uh, uh, Dr. Miriam Tawane. Um, she was saying that, um, unfortunately, when I was speaking to her, she couldn't unmute. And so she wanted to add that one of the aspects that we need to consider mm -hmm. as well is the lack of students of color participating in all the museum studies in our country. We are still very much underrepresented, and those are the states we need to pay attention to and come up with the solutions to address uh, this disparity. Thank you, Miriam, for, for, that, um, for that contribution. Uh, Nelson Zwane also was not able to come in earlier because of the noise at the head office where uh, there's a demolition of a building taking place, but he's participating in the discussion. So thank you very much for, for, for your comments. Um, and so let me open it up now for, for everybody else. Uh, Terence, Yako, um, Tebuho, is there anything that you're noticing from your side? I don't uh, see any raised hand so far. Dr. Matuma, uh, there are two yes, hands Matuma. raised. There are Sorry, Yako. Yes, there are two hands raised. Okay. Uh, Dr. Mohapi and then uh, Dix, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correct. And then uh, Motsane as well. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Let's start with uh, Dr. Mohapi. Dr. Mohapi. Thank you, Chair. I, I just wanted to appreciate the discussion uh, by all panelists. Um, I'm, I'm taking with me quite a number of, of of things uh, from the discussions. I'm particularly uh, going to pass on to EXCO the uh, request by Dr. Matole that we, uh, in collaboration, that, or the, um, the challenge that he's posing to us that we write a, a diary of women activists. I'm, I'm particularly going to pass on that one to, to, to EXCO. And yes, um, um, it was a very insightful discussion that we've had, and one has taken a lot with it. In the thank you, thank you, Dr. Muhapi, and thank you for 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 taking the challenge up to uh, the DMSA Exco. And I think it's a, uh, it is it is time that we do this. Um, that we do that. And, and I think uh, Dr. Mutsaka will be able to advise and assist, um, um, you know, as you come back from the EXCO report back, it would be, it would be good to take that initiative. Um, thank you very much for that, uh, Dr. Muhapi. Then there's the hand from uh, Gertrude Mutsane. Thank you, Dr. Matoma. Um, I couldn't, I had a connection earlier after Bonita's presentation, so I would like to comment on both uh, Haz and Professor Mutsehaz. Yes. Uh, Bonita, I'm, I'm, I'm... Hi, get to... Assuming... Yes. Sorry? Sorry, you can go ahead. Uh, our issue of museum officials moving away from assuming um, the ultimate authoritative um, voice and because of because they are regarded as experts and often are still excluding the, the people on the ground. So it's important that we at all times um, know that it is not about what we are take we are only the care takers of those objects but the museum is just a space for the people to tell their stories and it shouldn't be us telling those stories but give the space 
for the people to give their own voices. And we just have to, to find a way and workable ways to negotiate and through this cooperations. It can it, it can only be achieved through collaborations. And on Dr. Um, Motsera, uh he reiterated on the people first, and he also spoke to to the issue of decolonization in that we should use this collections that we are taking care of, and we can use them to trace the histories and unearth the cultures who, which which at this point are unknown to a lot of people and. Um, and this also speaks to the issue of restitution and repatriation. So we do have a lot of work to do. And that also can be achieved through collaboration. So thank you, Professor Mutsekha. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Gertrude. Uh, what I would just like to add is that um, the point that you're making, Gertrude, it's very, very critical. You know, um, actually the, 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 the objects in the museum uh, should be the point of discussion between the museum officials and the, the, the general public as they visit those institutions. Um, and it also helps a lot from the experience I had at the Robben Island Museum, uh, for instance, it helps a lot if the officials, museum officials are also very knowledgeable about the, the objects that they have. Um, I remember the one of the guides in Robben Island, we were in the bus, and uh, when we, we got to the lime quarry, um, you know, he stopped the bus and he says, you know, this is where the constitution was written uh, with Nelson Mandela, the political prisoners, they used to um, retire to, to that, you know, small cave in the quarry and start discussing the constitution as we have it today. So it has its origins there. I found that very interesting and all the international visitors there were very uh, interesting. In the same way, Gertrude, uh, the different museums we have at its own, whether it's Pioneer, whether it's Ellen Prenslow, uh, I remember Dr. Miriam Tawane taking me through, showing me Madame Place, you know, at the Natural History Museum and, and giving me a lot of history about uh, Madame Place as well. So it's, it's important that we once you have that knowledge, it's easier to relate with the public and members of the public and also to take them through. So thank you very much for that input, uh, Gertrude, very important. Um, there, there is a, uh, there's a message here, Dix uh, has to speak. I'm, I'm, taking, I'm, I'm taking note of the time. We still have entertainment um, coming up. Let me ask uh, Dix uh, to, to speak, to come in as well. Hi, how are you, Mr. Dr. Mtsera? You are Very speaking. Well you are speaking to Rachel from the Museto team in Amaskara. I had touching it the issue of drugs. We're an organization that deals with drug dealers, as we call them, drug addicts. We have a huge problem. We counsel them and we give them session, but we don't have rehabilitation center. We were asking the government if it could help us by building a rehab that is for free because we are dealing with the community that the unemployment rate is very high. Thank you, Dr. Mtia. Thank you, Dr. Mtia. I'm sure you have noted the, the request coming from Dix in Hammond's Graham. Uh, yes, I, I did, and I would want to get a contact so I can communicate with it. Okay. Dix, if you can just um, leave your details with uh, either Terence or Yaku or, or, or uh, Tebuho, that would be appreciated. Can I also add something? Yes, uh, uh, Professor. Now, I just want to quickly say that uh, the Chong and Kara Heritage Institute have an MOU. Yes. And uh, Kara also has an MOU with the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture, uh, signed in 2006, which is dormant. 
I wanted to suggest that uh, maybe we use the MOU between the Tsong and uh, Kara Heritage Institute in, in particular, and uh, identify other partners like the participants in this uh, uh, seminar who gave uh, very, very valuable uh, inputs and see if we can work together to use the resources in the various museums to develop heritage education materials and then start to work jointly to have, offer heritage studies because uh, our youth uh, are actually lost. For instance, uh, they will call South Africa Mzanzi, some will call it Azania, and this name, uh, 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 geographical name changes. It's also actually informed by things that we don't know which means uh, our democracy may be used to undermine our efforts uh, of African cultural uh, renaissance. But I, in short, I think that uh, this initiative that uh, Edith Chong and others have started is the initiative that can be the best anchor for the African cultural uh, renaissance. I think uh, uh, President Becky did his best, Mandela did his best, but now, uh, here, here I see activists that can take this forward better and effectively. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mutsekha. I think uh, Dr. Muhapi will also take that up with the DMSA executive. Um, it's a very good um, initiative and uh, it should be supported. Uh, thank you very much. Let me, um, Terence, you will need to guide me here. Debuho, uh, Yako, the, the Usutu Arts Productions are supposed to be entertaining us. Um, and I would like to know whether they are ready. And then also we will have, um, I think I'll give a minute each to the panelists to have their closing remarks. Um, and then I'll, I'll then summarize and then Yako uh, Skwonrat will give us the vote of thanks um, in, this, in the time that we have. We've got eight minutes to go. Um, Terence, are they ready? Yes, they are ready, sir. Okay, let's let's get that entertainment while the panelists are um, thinking about their closing remarks. One minute each. It's 
bird of 1960 whose tune was heard on a distant hill. For the caged bird cried for freedom, a gift of survival, a gift of survival, a gift of survival. Even now we still long for a gift of survival, an expression of self, a unique form of existence, a consciousness which is genetically related to a substance of mineral and cosmic pain. To those that were tortured, bruised, suffered hate, but still rose, rose and used their voices. A moment of silence to our human rights. A moment. I don't want to die with my hands up and my legs open. I feel laughter on every street, holding a knife. Women of South Africa experience every day a constant threat of social and sexual violence, a sick society in which we are living in constant fear as if we are living in a jungle or a war zone. Seeking merely to survive. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to, to Usu2 to, uh, Arts Productions. We, we really appreciate your entertainment. I really enjoyed it. And, uh, and most importantly, the message as well uh, that you were bringing through about gender-based violence, which is very relevant to what uh, women in, and, and children in South Africa are facing at the moment and the men, we should also join in that struggle. So thank you very much, Usu to Arts Productions. Um, we really appreciate uh, your participation. So let me move on to the closing remarks. I hope um, uh, Professor um, O'Connell is still here because I'm gonna give her, if she's still here, I'm gonna give her the, the last, the first um, a chance to make her closing remarks uh, because uh, she might be experiencing uh, load shedding uh, any minute from now. So uh, uh, Prof O'Connell, could you please uh, go ahead and give your closing remarks? Thank you, Dr. Matoma. I, I literally have a few seconds before the power go off. I just want to thank you all for um, inviting me to speak here today and that I take encouragement from the conversations that we have 
I think it's important and incumbent on us to draw in um, youth and particularly youth into our institutions at this stage. And we need to be creative in ways that speak to them because it's, it's, it's only in reaching out to that constituency that the institution of the museum will have any reasonable hope of making impact in the future. Um, so before I completely disappear, thank you once again, and it was indeed an honor to be here today. Chairperson, are you still there? We seem to have lost our chair. <laughs> it's gone, gone uh, underground. <laughs> Should Professor we just... Mutera, ah, sorry. Yes. I think you can also do your closing. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I just want to say that uh, let us... Uh, use this opportunity to move from protest to reconstruction and development of the African cultural heritage through museums. Uh, this year, because we are celebrating the 105th anniversary of uh, Mama Charlotte Manyama Kweke, who I prefer to describe as the mother of the South African nation. Let us uh, uh, give our people, especially women, uh, the tools of trade. And those tools of trade are books in indigenous languages, drama, theater, documentaries, artifacts, and promote artists like Usutu uh, production. And uh, let's use Mapungwe and its own museums as our point of departure. Uh, in uh, the Tsong, there are artifacts that dates back to the Middle Ages, which uh, today we can no longer even uh, uh, produce. So I think we have the tools of trade. Let's use them and move forward. I see uh, the self-appointed chair is laughing at me. I don't know what I've done. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's not you. It's <laughs> <laughs> not me. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, Dr. Mohabi? Okay. Um, I just want to say that while museums uh, continue doing their primary uh, business of preserving and researching and caring for uh, collections and all other primary responsibilities of museums. I just want to urge uh, museums to remember that we also have a responsibility, as I indicated, that the Cultural In Institutions Act talks about raising funds and it talks about, uh, and um, uh, we talk, also talk about job creation. We have a responsibility to create jobs as museums. Uh, we therefore have to change or reinvent ourselves. Uh, traditionally, museums were not really concerned with job creation. It was all about research and what we can do uh, in terms of research and preservation. But we have, like all other uh, states and all, all other agents of government, a responsibility to create jobs, uh, which uh, brings me to the idea of income diversification, which I spoke about. Uh, through a range of other non-museum programs because we know that government does not have money and it's not going to have money anytime soon. We have to start looking into what other things can we do to create um, income besides the traditional means of uh, income generation. We're talking of restaurants, we're talking of uh, public programs that are meant to create uh, income. And we're talking of um, 
activities that we would not normally um, would not normally offer and which will attract people who not normally come to museums. And yes, that's where I end uh, today. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mohabi. Uh, Ms. Bonita, are you still there? I'm, I'm here, I'm here. So maybe- Yes, you can. Sure, just to conclude with two things, maybe the one is coming back to my museum revolution that I want to advocate. I think an important part of that is relinquishing curatorial control and see how that works. I think it's very important that we don't just um, add people on as an, as an extra. It must be organic, it must be real. Um, and how do museum professionals move that center away um, from controlling the narrative in a sense? And I think we mustn't also assume, I think we need to invest more in museum staff in terms of skills development because, and this is just my very personal observation, what I've seen is that sometimes museums, you put your collections manager or you put whoever into a public process, we assume that everyone knows how to deal with public. Um, we send people for conservation training, but we don't send them to learn about facilitation skills and about methods of popular education, which I think is very important. So that's what I'd like to share. And the second point I'd like to make is also that you know, sometimes as a museum sector can be very inward looking and just networking with itself. And I think we must look to other sectors, social justice, academic, um, education, look at other sectors that are not only museum sectors. Um, there's a quote that always comes to mind when I think about this from a um, historian from Trinidad Tobago, C.L.R. James, who says, what does he of cricket know that only cricket knows. And so I think that's important that we must draw from other sectors so that we can enrich our sector as well. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, and I hope we don't lose this moment of thinking about um, our sector. We spoke mostly about museum, not so much the cultural sector, but we don't lose this momentum in terms of making a difference and that it isn't just another kind of um, Zoom call that we're having. Thank you. Thank you, Bonita. Uh, Terence, I think you're still in charge, no? <laughs> yeah, no, you can, you can, I you can finish now. I managed to get back in. I think you can just continue. Did uh, Professor Mutsaka speak already, the closing remarks? Yes. Has uh, yes. Professor Mutsaka given his closing he has. Oh, okay. Yes. Thank you. So I think we left with only one item, and that's uh, Yako Skwonrad. Uh, Mr. Yako Skwonrad, as we indicated, is from GMSA, and uh, he will be giving us the uh, closing remarks. Uh, Yako? Thank you, Dr. Matuma. Um, yes, I'll be thank doing both of thanks. Thanks, yes, yes. Okay, thank you for the opportunity to do this. Yako, are you there? I'm here, can you hear me? Yako? Yes, can you hear me? Did we lose Yako? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, you. Thank you, you, Yako. Yes, we can hear you. Ah, thank you. Yes, Yako, we can, we can hear you. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Matuma, for the opportunity, opportunity to do the vote of thanks. Um, so, Yes, I, I would like to, on behalf of the Tsong Museums of South Africa, which is an agency of the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture, the Council of the Tsong Museums of South Africa, the Chief Executive Officer of TMSA, Ms. Mrs. Annabelle Libete, members of EXCO, the directors of TMSA, uh, I want to extend a deep sense of appreciation for, for the following persons in particular. The people who made today not only happened, but, but uh, I think made a, lo a lasting impression by some of the remarks and ideas that they shared. So, um, firstly, Dr. Pandalani Matoma for the professional and democratic 
manner in which you have facilitated the dialogue uh, for keeping the program concise within the time frame. And then uh, the members of, of the panel, the panel members today, uh, who shared a great deal of information and their proof of profound experience in the field of heritage. A great uh, applause goes to all of these formidable panel members. Professor Matola Mochekha, founder and executive director of Kara Heritage Institute. Professor Siona O'Connell, senior lecturer from the Historical and Heritage Studies Department of the University of Pretoria. Dr. Molebo Heng Mohapi, our director at the National Museum of Natural History. And then Ms. Bonita Bennett, the independent researcher and former director of District 6 Museum. And then also for the entertainment that we, we had, which was very um, intense and touching, uh, to, uh, a thank you goes out to Mr. Kennedy Nekwa and the Usutu Arts Production for the professional entertainment in the form of poems and drumming and for the very touching performance that we heard and seen uh, that reminds us of the real meaning of Human Rights Day and why we celebrate it. Um, and then also our uh, Bese Molovetsi, the secretary to this and, and site manager of Kara Heritage Institute uh, for the communication with Professor Matola Mochekha, for keeping up to date with the latest progress regarding the program. Then coming to my colleagues at, at Itzong Museums of South Africa, who worked very hard to ensure that today was a great success. And I think it was really a great success. Um, uh, dear Dr. Molay Boheng Mohapi, our director of the Natural History Museum, for the approval of the project plan to host the webinar today. Um, Ms. Bongi Dinezani Legwasi, as our public programs specialist, for all the arrangements and the follow ups that she did by having frequent virtual meetings with us as a team. Um, Ms. Marit Conradi as an educational officer at Kruger Museum for the initiative to host this webinar today. Mr. Boko Pizzo, our education officer at Na National Museum of Natural History. And also Ms. Kumoto, Kumotio Moyo, tourist guide at Kruger Museum for all the inputs that you had on compiling this program. Then also Mr. Mr. Terence Mkonza, our educational officer at uh, the National Museum of Cultural History for the communication to the panel members and other coordination. Mrs. Lemo Hong Zinkumi, our marketing manager at DMSA for the beautiful invite and the distribution thereof. Our IT team at DMSA. And then um, lastly, all the members of the public and other institutions who attended and actively participated today in today's session. Uh, without you, there would have been only an echo without any reply. So, and then um, I would also end the vote of thanks with something that relates to unity, which we also touched on today as one of the themes of today. Uh, so at the funeral of Ma Charlotte Matreke at Cliptown, the eulogy ended with the words, she was everyone's friend and then no one's enemy. I thank you for, for very productive discussions and may you have a blessed long weekend that we are going into now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yako, and uh, thank you very, very much. We really appreciate for that comprehensive vote of thanks. If I had uh, attempted it, I would not have succeeded in the way that you say thank you to everyone. Uh, to the panelists, uh, let me remind you, please uh, make your contributions available to the DMSA team. Uh, you can send them to Terence. Um, and then to the DMSA team, once you have compiled the report, if you feel like, if you feel that you need us to um, look at it and make uh, some, uh, um, you know, inputs as well into the report before you send it up the structures of DMSA, please be free to do so. We will be able to, to help you, the panelists and myself. 
So thank you to everyone. Enjoy Human Rights Day on Sunday and the Monday on the holiday. Thank you so much uh, to the GMSA team for putting this together. Thank you. Thank Long you. Long live the chair. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you.